Hello, this is Jerry Orr supporting for Art Station, and right now we are with Kevin Young, who is the head of creative technology at the Mill. Kevin, thank you so much for being here today. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, and thanks for having me. Absolutely, we're so glad to have you. Now, I want to get started by talking about, you know, what the job of head of creative technology is. So, can you just describe, you know, the day-to-day -day responsibilities? You know, what the job entails. Yeah, it's quite varied actually. So. Being head of creative technology basically means you're managing the team, which I take to mean as supporting the team. So um, we have um, a team of about, I would say maybe 30 people worldwide. In London, it's probably closer to about 10 to 15. Um, and they cross a, you know, a wide range of skill sets as well. So it will be um, supporting the team in, in, in the projects they're currently working on, overseeing the, you know, the multitude of projects we currently have on the go. Um, and then also uh, liaising with producers and other people within the mill uh, to make sure that we have all the resources we need to have projects running um, uh, along the lines they're supposed to be. And, um, uh, you know, even get my hands dirty from time to time as well, if it's required. Mm. You know, something that I really appreciate about The Mill is they have a really diverse range of clients. If you go to The Mill's website for our audience, you can see that. You know, they have a lot of different clients from a lot of different industries. So can you talk a little bit about what the process is, you know, pairing uh, these emerging technologies with the clients who are actually using them for real world projects? Yeah, and it's, um, I think tech is an interesting differentiator as well at the moment in terms of the client projects. I think a lot of brands um, and companies are noticing that you know, you just can't get by with the, you know, the simple banner ads or, you know, um, a video advert anymore. You know, it's, you can really show off how forward thinking you are by marriaging uh, your um, your ideas and your brand concept with a piece of technology or something that shows that you're doing something new. Um, and it's a really exciting time at the moment in that um, technology is moving so fast. There's new platforms coming up. Uh, we have immersive realities as well, which is, if you think about, you know, the, you know, the canvases we've had to put um, work on before, you know, print media, TV, and now we have, you know, such thing as alternative realities. That's getting, you know, to be like a whole new canvas to work on. It really is, and I think that's a good segue to my next question, is finding the technologies that are growing. Because, of course, you know, alternative reality, virtual reality, those are well-known words by society. But, you know, five, six years ago, it was not as well known using these types of technologies for mainstream work. So how do you and your team find these new innovative technologies before, you know, the rest of the public actually understands what they are? Yeah, and I think a lot of it comes down to the kind of teams that we have. I think I myself, for example, I have a natural interest in these things. So anything to do with art, code, gaming will be naturally on my you know, leisure reading list. So I'll be you know, pilfering through things, reading articles online, um, following trendsetters and other artists who are also working in the same space. Um, and that's also very inspiring as well. And bit by bit, you're not necessarily looking at what new tech is out there, but you're looking at how all these different things can be combined to create new things. Because um, I always say the most important thing really is for something not to be tech-led, but to be idea-led. So you're coming up with the idea and the concept first, which can be informed on some level by the tech, but the idea has to come first and the concept has to come first. Then what you're trying to do is trying to find the tech to support that concept. And it's normally much better when it's that way around. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think that's a really good perspective because like you said, it keeps the art first, it keeps the project first, and I feel like that shows in the final product. Now, you just mentioned art, coding, gaming, you know, pre three pretty different fields. You have entertainment, you have art, and you have science and technology. Those are a lot of different skill sets that you have to bring to a singular job, you know, singular projects. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what skills you think are required to be in the creative technology industry? Yeah, I would say, yeah, having a natural interest, I think, is the most important thing because that keeps you up to date. It keeps you current. Um, it keeps you hungry for that more, you know, that information that you'll need in order to deliver things. Um, um, being able to code is, I think, pretty important, depending on which side you're going for. I, um, you know, just to give you an, um, an idea of how I got in involved with this, which was, you know, I'd have all these ideas and it would always frustrate me if, I would never be able to execute the ideas myself or if I'd have to hand them off to somebody else or if that idea would, you know, forever live as, you know, rough sketches in a sketchbook. And that's where, you know, I think that um, people in this, in this industry tend to have to wear many hats. Um, they have to have, be kind of multidisciplinary in the kind of things they can do in order to bring their ideas to life. 
if your idea is some you know audio based then you're going to need to know a bit of audio uh you, you know how does music work you know how do musical notes work you know what uh, notes are harmonic with each other in order to create pleasant sounds um you know you'll need to be able to design you'll need to be able to think about uh user experience you know layouts on a screen all these are important things in order to realize your vision um and it's true that while you're in um bigger teams that that can get more specialized but um i think a lot of the projects that we've you know uh, worked on we've usually benefited from having people who have a rounder skill set so they can kind of contribute in different areas so there's less of that friction between the disciplines and it's more harmonic to use that word again no i like that word i think that fits the situation <laughs> really well uh now if you are, you know, trying to get into this industry and you have so many things to think about, some people may feel they have to learn all these softwares, all these tools, all these different techniques before they can actually start doing the art itself. So for people who are a little bit scared of getting bogged down in the technology, the software, all the, you know, textbook learning, what advice would you give them to just, you know, jump into the art? Yeah, um, it's the easiest thing is just to get started. I think, and this applies to more than just creative tech or art. It's more about, you know, um, reducing the capacity for procrastination. You can spend ages kind of like, you know, flapping around with the tools, spend ages supposedly learning when actually the fastest way to learn is to actually jump in and do it. Because by failing fast, by um, figuring out how the tools work, um, it'll give you a much better idea of what's possible. Um, and also I find that if you're messing around and actually starting a project and getting involved from the off, um, the information that you um, learn off the projects kind of stays in your head for longer as well. Mm. Um, and it's a difficult thing, really. I mean, getting started in a field that you might not be familiar with, it can be daunting. But I would say approach it from the point of view that it could be exciting as well. You know, relish the excitement and use that to drive your learning. I think that's really well put, some really great advice. Now, we talked a lot about teams, so I think this is a good uh, time to ask, you know, like you said, you're generally leading people who are very well-rounded, and you're generally leading people who come from a lot of different industries just because the projects require a lot of different formats like we were talking about. So what is it like to be the leader of a team of people who often know fields very different than yourself and where the majority of your team is like that? Is there any challenges in managing people that may be outside your skill set? I think that's one of the more exciting levels about it. And I think um, it's important to know where your own blind spots are. The important thing is to be able to talk through things. You know, like somebody might have a vision for how something needs to be. Um, and someone might have um, an idea of, um, based on the expertise in a particular discipline of how things should be. And the idea, you know, the important thing is to find a compromise because the idea will take you to a place, you know, that could potentially elevate that project. But the experience in a particular discipline will make sure that it's usable and it conforms to you know whatever set of guidelines there are for a particular platform um and it's important to find the essence of both of those two things and find the compromise between the two in order for it to you know be the best it can be and um i think that's something that i've had to learn as well which is you know being able to identify your own blind spots is very important so that you know where to hand off the expertise if needed um but also um um have an eye on what's important for the project because someone who's just focused on you know got their head down and focusing on a particular discipline will not understand what the overarching aims or the global aims of that project are so you need to make sure that stays true at the same time as keeping that discipline um the way it should be as well absolutely and you mentioned guidelines of the format you're working in now for the most case people can work in the guidelines of the format but when you're working in a combination of formats that's never been done or a format that's never been done the guidelines generally aren't as defined yet so can you talk a little bit about the challenges of working in a format where there's no real rules yet or or suggestions recommendations on how to do certain things yeah i think that's what again makes it exciting because if it's not defined yet, it's like having an, the ultimate playground to kind of try things and, and see what works and, you know, um, do all the fun stuff. I always think that the most fun part of a project anyway is the prototyping, figuring out what does work. Um, and for things like, for example, VR and AR as an example, you know, that, you know, they're relatively new and in terms of user experience, there are no real, well, we're starting to get a few established guidelines now, but a lot of that is still up in the air. Um, and 
it's just important to be able to kind of prototype quickly and figure out what does work so that you can, can go into the rest of the project with a, a degree of confidence that what you're building is worth it. You know, I feel like that also may be satisfying because you're almost leaving your touch on the format, right? Since you're kind of defining the rules, the recommendations, the guidelines like we're talking about for the next round of authors, artists who are going to be working in the format. Do you ever see that happening where you're kind of defining it for the future? Uh, yes, very much so. Um, um, at the same time, they are just guidelines. Um, there's a phrase, I think it was Glenn Vilk who keeps on saying that there's no rules, only tools. I, I, you know, that's always stuck with me. That, you know, there, there shouldn't be any rules to this stuff, only tools to help you get started on the journey. And then you can, you know, you're free to kind of break those as you go forward. Um, with VR, I, th I found it extremely interesting in that, um, you know, it's such a high tech medium in terms of, you know, the feeling that it's giving the user. But at the same time, it's so backwards in that um, it limits what we can do in, you know, that we're expected to be able to do things, very simple things like use our hands in a natural way or, you know, even walk around a space. Those are things that VR still finds quite difficult. Um, and so I think, well, things like that, the rules are still very much up for grabs and you're not going to actually know what works until you actually try it. You know, it's so funny about virtual reality that it's generally like the smallest things that's always impressed me the most. Like, I think it was in Half-Life Alex where you can just like pick up a can, rotate it, and look at the can. You know, there's very little things that probably in 10 to 15 years won't matter, but because the medium is still being defined, just picking up a can digitally and being able to hold it naturally and look at it, mm -hmm. it's, un it's revolutionary. It's mm -hmm. amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Now, uh, going towards your project specifically, I remember an interview you talked about, I believe it was something for VR Chat, where you were talking about collaborating with other people you're working with through virtual reality, uh, alternative realities. So can you talk a little bit about you know, using these new mediums not only for the project itself, but for making the project itself. Another example I can think of is Lion King, using VR to help make Lion King where the artist can actually go into VR and look at the environment. So can you talk a little bit about using these tools to develop new tools almost? Yeah, um, I think VR, um, one of the things that really blew me away uh, way back when, I think it might've been 2015 or 2016, was seeing um, Glenn Keane, the animator, draw in tilt brush. And he drew um, the Little Mermaid in Tilt Brush. And it blew my mind and really rounds home the fact that um, this technology, this is one example of whether technology is enabling us in ways that, um, that we couldn't have perceived of before, like being able to draw in 3D, that whole spatial awareness, which is something that as human beings, you know, we rely on on day to day. Like, you know, we have two eyes, we can perceive depth. And, you know, we use that in everyday life. Like, um, I know we're talking on a flat 2D screen at the moment, but the fact that we can communicate is because of our brains have kind of adapted that we know how to uh, translate what we're seeing into 3D space. But up until this VR technology, we've had no accessible way of actually drawing in 3D. Everything has kind of been like a compromise, like, you know, sculpting in ZBrush on a flat 2D screen is something that still you know feels archaic once you've been able to sculpt in vr using vr controllers because you can actually move your you know your hands back and forth um and i think that's yeah so that's really enabling us in terms of like um um bringing that spatial awareness to the way that we construct things and now with something like vr chat or these social vr platforms the fact you can do that in a social setting as well so for example you know i make something um it could it could be a room you know another designer can jump into that room and then build something into that room at the correct scale to everything else then if we want to kind of see how things look in you know our mass as a as a global idea we can scale it down or make ourselves really big you know all these superpowers that you'd love to have if you you know we're building you know imagine if a, an architect had the superpower to kind of make themselves giant so they could see how their building looked in the context of a neighborhood you know it's something that we've only been able to imagine before, but the technology is enabling us to kind of properly perceive those kind of things in the ways that our brains will understand. Mm. It's you're absolutely right. You know, I, I just love watching people's uh, reactions when they first go into virtual reality because it's such a special time, like a uh, relevant example is like going into Google Earth VR for the first time mm -hmm. and walking around like when I, I lived in Los Angeles, walking around Los Angeles and noticing for the first time the flow of the city, how it's organized. You never noticed that before until you're the size of a giant on Google Earth. Mm -hmm. It's really, really amazing. Uh, yeah. Now, we've been talking about a lot of different formats, you know, virtual reality, video games, film and TV. Is there a certain format that you're really most excited for or you think people should keep an eye on for the future? Um, I think... AR has the potential to get 
much bigger than it is now. I think um, augmented reality or mixed reality, as some people are calling it, um, is a little bit limited right now because of the technology that we have. You know, everyone's doing it through their mobile phones, which, you know, straight away uses up a hand. So, you know, <laughs> you only got one other hand to play with. Um, but I think going forward, that could be a massive, um, not just um, an enabler for entertainment, but for utility as well. You know, I you know I remember seeing this thing, a concept, and it was one of the things that really stuck with me. This was way back in like the late '90s, where I saw a concept sketch of um, um, a car's GPS system. Uh, and yeah, it's pretty obvious to any car manufacturer, anyone who works with cars. But what what they had was they had the the route overlaid on the road in front of you, and it just makes so much sense, doesn't it? Why would you need to look at a separate screen when we can augment the world around us to show the information that we need? Um, and then once that starts to happen a lot more, once the technology gets better for that to happen seamlessly, then to kind of elevate that and turn it into entertainment as well. I think, yeah, AI is still in its infancy, even though it feels like it's been around for a long time. Um, but, you know, with the next round of tech, as tech gets better, smaller, more efficient, more power efficient, you know, that's just going to go um, accelerate from there on in. Yeah, it's really amazing seeing just what people are coming up with AR. I, I love the idea, you know, the map is in front of you, almost like it's a video game where you see the blue the blue path on the road. That yeah. sounds absolutely amazing. It'll make navigation so much easier and, and safer too. Yeah, but if you think about it, like you know, even something like GTA, where I don't know if you do this. Well, when I play GTA, I've got one eye always on the mini map in the bottom right corner. So and then you're thinking, um, I think it was um, Fable 2 that did this first, where they just overlaid the track directly in front of you and said, just follow this line. And of course, if the technology existed, that would be the best way to navigate, because you're not trying to marry two different things together in your brain. And once, yeah, once you have that, it would be so liberating, because you know all these senses that we've evolved with are just put to use in a way that we fully expect. There's no training or teaching people how to use things. It's just our natural instincts. Yeah, and like you said, you know, there's something just inherent about 3D, you know, when you're trying to learn the structure of something. Like, you know, I, one of my favorite things that VR and AR is doing is like solar system exhibits where you can really just look at planets and rotate planets and see the details of them. It just communicates something different than be, than seeing a planet in two dimensions because we're naturally 3D creatures and it really just makes us naturally feel that. Now, one of the technologies that's allowing all of this to happen is real-time, real-time rendering, compositing, animating. You know, real-time is everywhere right now. It's one of the biggest buzzwords in the CG industry, I guess you could say. So to you personally, uh, what are you most excited for for real-time? Is there any application of real-time rendering that you're really most excited for for the future? Yeah, this is a funny question for me because um, as anyone who's lived with video games for a while, um, real-time is just almost the default. It's like, it's what you expect things to be. Um, and now the rest of the, um, well, the VFX industry is starting to latch onto real time now as a way of, you know, accelerating creativity, um, um, shortening rendering times, which can get horrendous at times. Um, but real time for me is always about that interactivity, being able to change things on the fly, being able to do things like, um, you know, uh, multiple user collaboration, for example, would not be possible without, re without real time. Being able to um, create uh, interactive narrative. Again, that's something that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very um, into, and I know video games have been in for, you know, been around for a long time, but um, it's still not the default mode of um, entertainment. You know, you'd say TV and film are still, you know, up there. Video games still can't, aren't quite respected on that level. But, you know, with things like Fortnite and Roblox and, um, you know, all these Minecraft, um, all these, that's, you can see that then with the next generation, that could very easily change. And so that's what I'm looking forward to most with real time is the, like these new forms of entertainment, new dominant forms of inter entertainment that are interactive. Mm. What I love about your industry and what you're doing is you're working on a almost spectrum of interactivity, you can say, you know, going from film and TV where it's mostly just, you know, perceiving, you know, you're watching, you're listening, you don't have a part of the story, all the way to video games, VR, where you are an integral part to the story. So do you think there's any, like, universal way of conveying to the audience, you know, communicating to the audience, connecting with the audience across these formats, across this spectrum of interactivity? Yeah, I think brands have got a big part of that. The way that um, brands can almost be like the glue to link these different um, platforms across that spectrum. Um, I think a really good example of that was the um, how popular Pokemon Go became 
in 2016 and how the marrying of augmented reality with a very strong brand that had a, you know that was a really good conceptual fit for the tech you know really allowed that to kind of you know launch um stratospherically on a completely different platform so um you know if you imagine pokemon you know existing right from you know trading cards to video games and now augmented reality that's that's an interesting way of how brands can um a strong enough brand can bridge that gap it's so funny to think now that you mentioned that that when i was a kid the main way people played pokemon was cards mm -hmm. and then very quickly became video games and now we have augmented reality you know if you showed so a kid in 2005 pokemon go they would think it's sci-fi technology it's amazing how fast things are growing so in the future because things are probably going to only grow faster is there any i know this is very hard to answer but is there any like innovation or technology that you're most looking forward to seeing in the future yeah, well, Pokemon Go, again, is a very good example of that in that what I found most fascinating about Pokemon Go is how it was packaging all that technology in a way that people didn't realize. Um, like, you know, the, I guess the showboating aspect of Pokemon Go was the fact you could put these Pokemon into, uh, onto your table right in front of you in a very crude way. Um, but actually, what the really interesting thing about Pokemon Go was um, the fact that it had an alternate version of the real world overlaid on top of our actual world, where Pokemon could live, you know, congregate in different spaces. You would have, um, you know, like these virtual locations overlaid on top of our real world landmarks. That was the really interesting thing about Pokemon Go, which is completely transparent in terms of the experience but it enables so much. And I think that's the way things will go. I think if you imagine, um, you know, on one layer, you've got Pokemon Go. On another layer, you have, say, like historical facts about the building that you're currently walking next to. Or, um, you know, um, I work in London, so, so, you know, walking past, you know, uh, the haunts of Jack the Ripper or where Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote Sherlock Holmes, things like that. But, you know, educationally, there's so much potential there as well. The fact, you know, the fact that we have this real world space that, you know, we're very familiar with, but we could augment that space with multiple layers of information. I find that very exciting because, again, that can be used for both utility and entertainment. Absolutely. I mean, just the educational qualities. I know we've been talking about, you know, those types of qualities, like, again, the solar system example, such a great, great way to learn about a world and outside our world as well. Now, I want mm -hmm. to talk a little bit about artists specifically, artists who are trying to get into this industry. So do you think there are universal skills they can learn? Because we've been talking about a lot of technology, a lot of different forms. But are there skills that are not going to change across projects, across the evolution of technology that artists should master? Yeah, I think I think one thing we can say for sure is that game engines are here to stay. So getting used to working with a game engine, I think, will be very important going forward because that is the enabler for all things real time. Um, and there are multiple game engines out there. Some of them might not be even considered game engines, but like, you know, Unity and Unreal, I think, are, are the forerunners of game engines at the moment. Um, I think the web will make a massive comeback as well. So running um, 3D content on the web. Um, um, it's a bit of a shame. I used to be a Flash designer and developer back in the day. And that was such a, um, an important enabler for uh, creatives like myself to get to grips with code and to be able to kind of create things beginning to end by themselves. Um, but game engines are doing the same thing um, for the current generation. So, you know, download a game engine, anything you can make, whether you're a, a 2D artist or a 3D artist, if you can get your content in a game engine, you can make it interactive. And if you can make it interactive on one of those game engines, you can share it. You know, you can put it out there and people can download it, enjoy it. And these engines have got so much capability these days. You know, if you wanted to kind of publish your own game, you could do that. If you wanted to make a real-time movie, you could do that. If you want to make an interactive movie, you could um, publish it in an inter interactive format and then stick it on the web somewhere. I mean, the scope is endless, but uh, game engines are, are currently the enabler for all of that to happen. They really are. And for our audience, if you want to learn game engines, ArtStation Learning has a lot of tutorials about game engines. Check them out. We also talked to Mark Petit, the general manager of Unreal. So if you want to learn a little bit more about game engines in the future, check out that interview with him. We talked a little bit about Unreal Engine 5, you know, the future. And it's kind of funny. There's a lot of cross-sections with our talk here, especially about 
the uh, growth with uh, VR and uh, uh, 3D objects becoming commonplace in society. So looking towards the future again, do you think that there are any sort of industries or anything that people should take a specific look at since we've been talking about technologies, but industries, you know, any new places that these technologies can be applied? Yeah, I would say gaming obviously is a big one because, um, you know, the, you know, gaming tends to push the hardware to the limits most most times. I think machine learning is quite um, a geeky pursuit to get into because it's, you know, uh, there's a lot of math involved. Um, but what I'm finding at the moment is that there are machine learning tools coming out now that um, kind of wrap things in such a way that you don't need to know the base principles of it. You can just use the fancy tools and get some good results out of them. And that's going to be a big thing going forward. So keeping an eye on potential machine learning is important because it shows you um, basically all the stuff we used to think that was science fiction when we were growing up, machine learning is making possible. Uh, um, the example that always comes to my head is like in Blade Run, Blade Runner, when Deckard goes to a you know video screen and says "enhance" five times, or it happens every episode of CSI as well. Um, and the fact that they're able to kind of up-res the image and um, turn it into high definition just by saying "enhance," that's something that machine learning can do, which I never thought would be possible. That's kind of kept me humble as well. That you know, never presume the impossible because you know, chances are. Machine learning has showed me that no matter how impossible you think something is, there might be a way forward for it. One of my favorite examples and one of recent examples is Photoshop. You know, they have that super size tool you're talking about where you can just magically make a photo higher res. I don't know how they do it, but it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> and uh, I also love GPT-3, I think it's called, you know, the, uh, the text-based uh, mm -hmm. AI that's able to basically generate text as if a human wrote it. Of course, there's still issues, but it's amazing, you know, it's very cohesive, it's very understandable. And I'm sure that a lot of people are excited, but I think there's also a few people who are a little bit concerned because one of the aspects of AI and machine learning is making tasks easier. And I feel like a lot of artists are concerned that the fut in the future, they may not have a role if what they do can be done by an AI. So for artists who do feel a little bit concerned about the future of AI and machine learning, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I think, you know, you just got to embrace the tools. I'm sure, um, you know, when digital painting came on the scene, yeah, um, a lot of traditional artists thought, well, that's not real art or, um, you know, what am I going to do if um, digital makes it so much easier? But you just got to embrace the tools. Is machine learning, um, you know, you know, it's a common argument. You know, if you do machine learning, is the AI doing the work or is it just a more elaborate pencil in order to create things with? And I think it is just a more elaborate pencil. Someone has to wheel that tool in a way that's, um, it's not going to be making, it's not going to be making creative decisions for you. You're just, somebody is still making the creative decision to wheel that AI in such a way to get the results they're looking for. Mm. I think GPT-3, going back to that, is a great example of that, because while it can write, you know, sentences that somewhat makes sense, it's still not going to write poetry. It's not going to write an award-winning book because, you know, there's some humanity behind those words that uh, AI, machine learning, at least right now, can't replicate. Do you feel that th we'll ever get to that stage where it can replicate? Or do you think that's just pure science fiction? There'll always be that human aspect, AI, AI machine learning can't replicate. It's a very good question. Um, and we have, there have been, I've had numerous pub chats about this topic as well. It's the kind of thing geeks <laughs> talk about <laughs> over, over beer. Um, <laughs> Personally, I think it's not going to happen um, in the short term. Um, I think a good um, one of my kind of way markers for the direction this could go is um, there was a Black Mirror episode. Um, I don't know if you've seen Black Mirror, um, but there's the episode um, Be Right Back where um, 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 a lady brings her dead partner back to life by having an AI scour his social media messages to kind of pick up his patterns of speech and uh, and uh, and then create a chatbot um, uh, that can respond the way he would. So she can communicate with him as if he was um, still there. And I think you could probably facsimile somebody if um, using techniques like that, if you're able to kind of uh, grab enough data about that person. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the amount of information we put out there is not necessarily who we are. But then it might be enough to kind of create some kind of virtual being that's able to kind of make a certain amount of creative decisions in the style of somebody else. If you imagine like um, 
I, um, I don't know <laughs> if you'd remember this, but the, you used to be able to buy these CDs and the CDs would be like these very cheaply recorded um, um, uh, session artists um, in these tiny studios. And it would say, I don't know, ABBA, something in the style of ABBA or, and it would be like all these complete knockoff covers of these songs. And I think it could be a little bit like that where, you, you know, it's aping the style of somebody, but it's not actually coming up with anything completely original. I think that's a great way of putting it. It makes a lot of sense, and I feel like that is what we'll see in the future. We are running low on time, but before we go, do you have any other advice for artists watching? Um, yeah, I'll just say keep learning. I think don't be scared of um, just starting things and giving it a go because that's more than what other people will be doing. A lot of people just kind of sit around and you know um, procrastinate over their ideas, and when they come up and when they see their ideas done by other people, they go, oh, I had that idea, but you know, um, ideas are cheap. It's the execution that's important, and that's where a lot of people are going to be falling over. So, if you know, even if you just start something, and start, you know, bring your ideas to life, that's more than what eighty percent of the world is doing. So, it's worth doing. I completely agree, and it's getting so much easier on the execution side. Software is free, learning it is free. It's becoming accessible. Computers are so powerful. Like you said, almost anybody at home can make a real-time film now. That's amazing. That is so so revolutionary. Yeah. You've got to take advantage of all this stuff while it's here because it's a very unique point in time at the moment where, like you say, everything is so accessible. The fact that technology is free, the fact that we, you know, we've lived through, what was it, 13 months of pand pandemic where uh, we, you know, we've been able to kind of stay in touch with so many people like we are now via the, you know, the wonders of technology. You know, the, you know, it's opening up so many doors, not just to be able to kind of study and learn, but also collaboration as well, to be able to reach out to different people for things that you don't know. You have resources like ArtStation that, you know, if you want to learn something, you know, a bit like um, back when I was growing up and you wanted to learn something, if your library didn't have the book, there'd be no way of learning it. And it's, it's such a big shame that you know, that you think about all the talents in the world that have gone to waste because they never had the resources to kind of continue their desired path or to, to um, you know, learn their passion. But now those resources are there. It's affordable. It's all online. Um, there's no reason not to do something. There really isn't. Kevin, thank you so much for talking to us today. And thank you so much for all this amazing advice. No, thank you for speaking to me, and I'm very interested in the work you've done as well. Um, I noticed you've written a book, which I would love to kind of um, <laughs> um, ask you about later on. Absolutely. For our audience, make sure to check out much of The Mill's work. They are doing such amazing things. Kevin is doing amazing things at The Mill. And also, like Kevin mentioned, check out ArtStation. We, only not, we not only have ArtStation Learning, where you can learn so many amazing skills, we also have ArtStation itself, where you can see a lot of amazing artwork from many different mediums, from many different artists. It's an amazing place for inspiration. To see it, go to ArtStation.com. But thank you so much for listening. I'm your host, Jerry Orr, signing off. Bye.